The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Atria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was ruler of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I might not be able to see all of you this morning. I'm not used to the sunshine this December. Well, as you heard, Christmas is a time for cluttering. For most of us, our calendars are already filled. And yet, we still find more things pushing themselves in upon us. Be honest. Most of us know that our lives, our homes, and our schedules, our world, are already overstuffed. And guess what? Here we're bringing out more stuff. When we begin to decorate, boxes are pulled out from the attic and the basement and the closet, or maybe all three places, and we begin to unpack the decorations and we bring them out, and they're filled with so many memories and we cherish all of them. But in order to find a place to put them, we have to rearrange some of the stuff that we already have out in our homes during mo the rest of the time of the year. And most of our homes already have things filling the shelves and the tables and the cabinets, and here comes more stuff. Well, of course, the world doesn't stop for this season. Many still have to work or to keep appointments or do the things that keep our lives running. But now we must find more time for other things, for people and friends and family. And we add this to our already hectic world of more things that we must do. There, then there is the shopping. The times we live in make it even uh, a greater challenge. We desire to please those uh, loved ones by giving them things that we hope will fit into our budget and what we have to spend. Well, of course, that takes more time and more effort. In our calendars and our homes and our budgets, if those things were not parables enough about uh, the clutter of Christmas, how about our waistlines? Even the best intention diets is challenged with all the sweets and the goodies offered during the holidays. Too much time around the dessert table can give us another parable of cluttering. Well, as the rush and the hurry of preparing for Christmas begins to crowd into our already filled lives, we hear perhaps with new meaning the words from the prophet Malachi from our first lesson for today, but who can endure the day of his coming? Well, of course, he wasn't talking about preparations for Christmas. Malachi was dealing with something of far greater magnitude of standing before the judgment of God. But I think his warning still bears listening to as we approach another Christmas season. We don't know how much perhaps the wise men paid for their gifts, much less if they found them on sale. We really don't know how much time or effort the shepherds invested in uh, their coming to Jesus, but we know that both the wise men and the shepherds came for one reason, to worship and adore the one who came at Christmas. They were not distracted by the clutter in their lives. You know, you think of the wise men, out of all the stars that are in the sky, they focused on one that brought them to the Christ child. Or the shepherds, they had this responsibility of caring for all the sheep, but they said, hey, we're just going to have to leave them behind, and we're going to go and see what the angels have told us about. 
And so now we come this morning to John the Baptist, who speaks out in our gospel this day. He's one of the more char colorful characters from the Bible. He wore a camel hair coat long before they were fashionable, if they ever were fashionable. His diet consisted of locusts and wild honey, and his marketing techniques weren't the best in all of history. It says he went out into the wilderness, away from the city, away from the crowds, in order to do what? Attract crowds. He seemed determined to fail, and despite all these things that we would call poor advertising, the Bible tells us that people from all the region came flocking to hear this message. The challenge in John's word in the wilderness uh, came from the prophet Isaiah, spoken at the time Israel was in exile in Babylon. Separating God's people from their home was a wilderness, a barrier that appear, appeared impossible to deal with. The promise in Isaiah 40, where we find the words that John uses, is that comfort will come to God's people, and that the wilderness, a way in the wilderness, is being prepared. The way will be prepared for them, not by them, but by God's doing. See, the people of Israel were exiled to Babylon because they were captives and could not make a way for themselves in the wilderness. God had to do it. God had to do it by bringing down one empire and raising up another one, another one that would allow them to return to their homeland. In the geopolitics of the ancient Middle East, the people of Israel, they were nobodies. But God made a way for them. God made a way for them through the wilderness of their exile so that they could return home. In the time of John the Baptist, who uses these words from the prophet Isaiah about making a way, he offers that up for them as well. But how could this people make a way? For they were a people who were oppressed. They were occupied. We hear about their hated Roman rulers, Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate, the brutal governor. We hear about their puppet rulers, Herod and Philip and Lysanias. How could this oppressed people make a way for God's coming? How could this people prepare for their salvation when they didn't even know when or how it would happen? But John is persistent in his proclamation. He says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The way will be prepared for them, not by them, not by him, but by God. All they have to do is unclutter their lives. Okay, maybe that's not the words John used. He said, repent, repent, John says, and walk the way God has prepared. For one is coming who will make all things new. For he is the one who makes every valley to be filled in and every mountain and hill made low and the crooked made straight and the rough ways made smooth. Emmanuel, God with us, is coming, John proclaims. In this Advent season, John the Baptist reminds us once again that God is making a way for us in the wilderness of this world by the birth of a baby in Bethlehem. Through this lowly birth, all flesh, all people, will see the salvation of God. For Jesus comes leveling the mountains of our fears and our prejudices and our pride and our selfishness, offering us a vision a vision of the horizon of a new life that lies ahead. Jesus comes and he fills in the valleys, the lowest places in our lives, our worries and our griefs and our doubts, offering us instead peace and comfort and hope that one day can raise us up so that we too may know and experience the joy of God's timeless love and mercy. Jesus comes straightening out the crooked ways of our sinful humanity with its injustice and its violence and hunger, instead promising us forgiveness and peace 
and abundance. Our Savior Jesus Christ comes, making a way in the wilderness of our lives, offering us a new way of living and being in this world and in the world to come. Jesus offers us and all people a way. You know, before the followers of Jesus were called Christians, they were called people of the way. They followed this new way of being and living because of their encounter and their relationship with Jesus Christ. It gave their lives meaning and purpose and sustained them in all of their struggles and all of their trials in life, some of which included persecution and some included death. But all were invited to follow in this way. For Jesus seeks nothing less than the salvation of all. For our part, John the Baptist calls upon us to repent. That is, to unclutter our lives from all those things that would prevent us from following in Jesus on the way. We cannot bring about our own salvation. We cannot make our own way through the wilderness any more than those exiles in ancient Babylon or the crowds listening to John the Baptist down by the River Jordan. But we can push aside those things in our lives that hold us back, that keep us from stepping out and walking the road Christ has set before us. Whether it's our material possessions or our fears or our wants or our desires or our politics or anything else that is cluttering our lives, John calls upon us to push that aside, to turn away from them and turn toward the one who makes all things new the one whose birth we are soon to celebrate, the one who has invited so many generations to follow and walk the way before us. See, the road is before us. The king is coming. Let us step out of the darkness and into the light. Let us be on our way. Amen.